Tonight, Stephen will be taking uh, recent developments in parole as the subject of his lecture. And his lecture will be entitled Radical Transparency, Opening the Parole System in England and Wales to Greater Scrutiny and Accountability. Will you please join me in welcoming tonight's distinguished speaker, speaker Professor Stephen Shute. Um, thank you very much indeed, Jeremy, for those uh, uh, warm words, and it's uh, a delight for me personally to be introduced by you. We've had a very long friendship and a very uh, uh, fruitful and collaborative professional relationship uh, as well. Please forgive my voice a little bit today. I've got a cold, and uh, it's been with me for about a week. I've been trying everything I can to um, minimise its impact, so um, uh, you'll just have to bear with me if I break uh, down and start coughing. So. Um, I'm going to talk um, this afternoon or this evening about um, the parole system and some of the changes that have been made recently. The lecture will be divided into five parts. I'm going to begin with some general reflections on parole. I'm then going to talk about the John Warboys case, the Black Cab Rapist case, and the catalyst that that became for um, reform of the parole system in England and Wales. I'm then going to say some words about transparency and accountability and some of the measures that have been introduced to make the system more accountable and more transparent. I'm going to then look at the Colin Pitchfork case as a case study for some of the dilemmas and challenges that all parole systems face, and then I'll offer some concluding uh, thoughts. So, some general reflections on parole. Starting with a definition, what is parole? Well, roughly speaking, parole is a mechanism through which a prisoner may, in virtue of a discretionary decision made in the prisoner's favour, be released from custody in circumstances in which, unless that decision um, was taken, the prisoner will remain confined for the remainder of the custodial component of their sentence. And in England and Wales, the main focus of the parole system has been on prisoners serving indeterminate sentences. That's prisoners who, unless they are released on parole, who will spend the rest of their natural lives in custody. And these prisoners will either have committed the crime of murder, for which the only sentence in England and Wales is um, a sentence of life imprisonment, or they will have been considered so dangerous that the court sentencing them concluded that only an indeterminate sentence uh, was appropriate. So what's the role of the parole board? Its role is to assess the extent to which a prisoner still represents a risk to the public. In other words, the parole board is in the business of risk assessment. That's its raison d'etre. And when it um, makes judgments about risk, it does so by reference to a statutory test. 20 words that um, uh, are drawn from the statutory provisions. And in England and Wales, the statutory test requires the board to ask whether it's, quote, necessary for the protection of the public for the pr prisoner to continue to be confined. And that's been interpreted by the courts, those 20 words, to mean that a prisoner should not be released unless there is no more than a minimal risk of the prisoner causing serious harm to the public generally or to particular members of the public if they were to be returned to the community. So the sole focus of the board is on the safety of the public. And that means that a whole raft of considerations are out of scope. Whether the prisoner has earned release, whether the prisoner deserves to remain in prison for the offence that he or she has committed, that is out of scope. In other words, it's not the board's business to resentence the prisoner uh, and conclude what an appropriate custodial term might be. Also out of scope is whether the prisoner has um, uh, been failed by the prison system, whether they are, as it's sometimes put in the language of parole, stuck in the system, whether the prisoner will suffer hardship from their continued imprisonment, whether the board feels sorry for the prisoner and their predicament, uh, 
whether there might be broader humanitarian concerns about their imprisonment, whether the prisoner's crime is notorious, or indeed whether the victims have requested or expressed a wish that the prisoner should remain in prison. It's illegitimate for the board to give weight to any of those considerations in its decision making. There are four fundamental tenets that underpin indeed every parole system, but the parole system in England and Wales. And they are as follows. First, that many, although perhaps not all, prisoners can change over time. So there's a belief that prisoners can change. Then, there's a belief that at least some of those changes will be relevant to the risk to the public that the prisoner is deemed to pose. Thirdly, it's a, a fundamental tenant that, with relevant training, expertise and experience, skilled risk assessors will be able to identify those changes to an acceptable level of accuracy. And finally, that those skilled risk assessors will also be able to judge again to an acceptable level of accuracy, the residual risk to the public that the prisoner continues to pose after the relevant change has occurred. So what sort of evidence for change might the parole board be looking for? Well, uh, to use the language of parole risk assessment, the board will be looking for the development of various so-called protective factors. And these can include new internal controls or pro-social attitudes that a prisoner has developed. And the enhancement of those internal controls or um, the internalization of new pro-social attitudes may be judged to have arisen as a result of the impact of different rehabilitative interventions or programs that a prisoner may have experienced while in custody, or simply from the opportunity that the prisoner may have had while in prison to reflect on his or her crimes. The board may conclude that a prisoner has not developed the necessary internal controls to maintain his or her risk at a level which meets the statutory test. But it does not follow from that that such a prisoner will necessarily be denied parole. For the board has an additional duty to consider whether any other measures might be available to monitor, to reduce, or to control that risk to an extent which will allow them to be safely managed in the community. In other words, the presence of these so-called external controls, contrasted with the internal controls that I mentioned a moment ago, those external controls may be deemed sufficient to reduce the prisoner's risk to a level which meets the statutory test. In most cases, not all, but in most, those external controls which are used to manage, manage monitor, or reduce or control the prisoner's risk will take the form of the various license conditions that the board can impose when it directs that a prisoner should be released on parole. So the role of those license conditions is to provide a set of rules which governs a parolee's behavior when they are released from custody. Their purpose is preventative, not punitive and their imposition needs to be both necessary and proportionate in order to be lawful. So their function is to protect the public and to prevent reoffending and to help secure, if possible, the prisoner's reintegration into the community after potentially a long period in custody. There are what are called standard license conditions, and those are the ones that um, are uh, automatically introduced into a parole license. And examples include a condition that requires a parolee to be of, quote, good behavior, unquote, and rather obviously, quote, not to commit any offense, unquote. And the parolee must also follow the instructions that are given to them by their supervising officer. And now the terminology for a supervising officer is a community offender manager, or COM as it's known. 
to receive visits from the COM and to reside permanently at an address approved by the COM or obtain permission from the COM to stay overnight at one or more, um, one or more nights uh, at a different address. So those are the standard license conditions. But there's also a whole raft of additional license conditions that may be imposed at the discretion of the board. And these can include uh, further restrictions on residency, um, restrictions on specified conduct or um, on specified acts, requirements to participate in um, programs of different kinds or defined activities, conditions relating to terrorism or extremism, restrictions on what the parolee can own, possess, control or inspect, for example, restrictions on the um, use of electronic devices, which might be, include computers or mobile phones or other electronic devices. Disclosure requirements of different kinds, including very often requirements to disclose developing um, intimate relationships. Uh, in controls around employment. Curfews, which require parolees to uh, uh, remain indoors uh, after a particular uh, point in time at night and to stay in uh, doors until a particular time in the morning. Uh, exclusion zones which can be narrowly drawn, a house or a street or very widely drawn, a whole town or even a region. Um, Non-contact provisions to keep them away from victims uh, or, or, or uh, others such as um, known criminal associates. Polygraph requirements. Um, Requirements to um, undergo mandatory drug testing, to wear sobriety tags to control alcohol use, electronic monitoring, whether it's um, monitoring curfews or location monitoring using uh, GPS. And in addition to all that, bespoke license conditions can also be imposed by the board, which are tailored specifically to the individual in question. And there are compulsory license conditions too, but there's only one of those um, at the moment that is required by law to be in certain licenses, and that is for um, acquisitive crime, where there's a, a compulsory license for um, requiring electronic monitoring. So this whole raft of license conditions, external controls uh, that are placed on prisoners. So what are the consequences of breach of any of these conditions set out in the license? Well, the answer is that if a prisoner is to breach any of those license conditions, they may be recalled to custody for their breach if the breach is deemed to show that the prisoner presents an unmanageable risk of serious harm to the public or if there's judged to be an imminent risk of further offences being committed. In England, Wales, it's not an offence to breach a license condition in a uh, parole license, but it is in some other countries. Okay, so that's some general setup explaining how parole operates uh, in, in England and Wales. I'll now say a few words about the um, War Boys uh, case. Um, after a parole, many of you will remember the Black Cab Rapist case. After a parole hearing, an oral parole hearing, held in November 2017 in a high security dispersal prison, HMP Wakefield, John Warboys, who was a Category A uh, prisoner, um, uh, um, was uh, released, or there was a direction for his release uh, by the parole board. He was serving an indeterminate sentence for the protection uh, of the public uh, for uh, sexual offences committed in the, black, uh, in the back of his black cab uh, in London. And as soon as news of that decision entered the public domain in January uh, 2018, it was taken in um, November 2018, there was an immediate and strong negative reaction across the political parties and in the media. And a highly publicised judicial review uh, followed the first time that a release direction by the board, rather than a refusal, um, had been challenged in the courts and led by its president, Sir Brian Leveson, the, uh, a strong divisional court quashed the board's decision. And on the day that the um, decision of the divisional court was released, the 28th of March, the then chair of the parole board, uh, Professor Nick Hardwick, resigned and he'd received the judgment two days uh, earlier. <laughs> 
And there can be no doubt that the board handled the War Boys case badly. And I've written about the War Boys case and what went wrong and how it uh, came about that that decision might have been made in the Criminal Law Review in an article which was published at the beginning of this year. And it's been rightly, in my view, described as the lowest point in the board's 55, 56 year history. Uh, and the loss of political and public confidence that um, came in the wake of that decision became a major catalyst for change uh, in the system. Some of those changes were announced by the Justice Secretary as soon as the board's decision to direct War Boys' release became public in January 2018. Others were set in train the moment that Sir Brian Leveson's judgment was released. And a final tranche of uh, reforms followed the publication of the Root and Branch Review of uh, Parole, which was in the Conservative Party's 2019 uh, manifesto and was finally completed in March 2022. And many of the reforms in the Root and Branch Review are, have been folded into the Victim and Prisoners Bill, which is making its way through Parliament uh, at this very uh, moment. So now something about why transparency and accountability matters so much. And there are four key reasons why transparency um, uh, is important to the operation of the parole system in England and Wales. First, as the government explained way back in 1997 when it um, uh, produced a white paper called Your Right to Know, which preceded the introduction of the Freedom of Information Act, there is a strong principle in public life that openness is fundamental to the health of a modern liberal democracy. And it follows that people should have the right to know about the activities of public authorities unless there's a very good reason uh, uh, for them not to. In other words, the default position ought to be disclosure. Second, the parole board acts in a judicial capacity. It's therefore subject to the principle that unless there are very strong reasons to the contrary, um, justice ought to be dispensed openly criminal courts, our civil courts are open. Third, as with all criminal justice agencies, much of the legitimacy of the parole board comes from the trust that citizens and indeed politicians place in it. And finally, secrecy can have a corrosive effect on institutions, leading to complacency or even defective decision making. And to uh, guard against that, the, as I put in the abstract for this talk, the US Supreme Court Justice um, Louis Brandeis uh, famously uh, said at the beginning of the 20th century, sunlight is the best of disinfectants and electric light the most efficient policeman. Following the War Boys decision, as I've indicated a moment ago, there was a series of measures that were introduced to open up the system. There was a BBC Two television documentary entitled Parole, and some of you uh, may have watched um, parts or even all of that. That had actually been in discussion since 2014, but it finally came to fruition in 2023. And it's a remarkable fact that uh, for the under 35 demographic, it achieved the second highest viewing figures to Love Island. Um, there were also a set of measures to enable victims to attend parole hearings and read their victim personal statements out to the parole board in person. And in addition to that, we've had the introduction of decision uh, summaries, the reconsideration mechanism, and public hearings. And I'll say a word about each of those uh, uh, three things too. There was also a review of the victim contact service, which is not run by the parole board, but is run by um, the uh, probation service, um, uh, which um, was completed in February 2018 as a result of the problems that arose um, with ensuring that victims were properly informed of war boys' uh, release. So, starting with decision summaries. These were introduced on the 22nd of May 2018, so not long after the War Boys um, uh, judicial review case. And they're now produced at scale. Um, in 2021-2, for example, 1,706 decision summaries uh, were uh, produced. And I think there's no doubt that they are popular uh, with victims, 
Um, but there is a problem about transparency and openness because they aren't published by the board. They're made available to victims and you can request them if you wish, but they aren't um, made available on the parole board's uh, uh, website. They're drawn up by people who are called former active members of the parole board rather than the um, members of the panel that decided uh, uh, the case. They're a step forward, but um, for me, as I'll say in a moment, um, full publication would be um, uh, highly desirable. Now the reconsideration mechanism, and of all the changes, this is probably the most significant. Um, it came into force on the 22nd of July, uh, 2019. I'll say a few words about the shape of the scheme. Under this reconsideration mechanism, eligible parole decisions become final only if and no application for reconsideration has been received within 21 days of the date of the decision letter from the panel. And during that application window, prisoners will not normally be released, although application, um, preparations can continue for their release. And if they were to be released, the board has no jurisdiction to um, uh, reconsider the decision. They shouldn't be released, but if they were to be, the jurisdiction uh, falls away. Uh, the board's power under the reconsideration procedure is limited to either directing that a provision, provisional release decision is reconsidered or to dismiss the application. So it's a binary um, uh, decision. If the board agrees that the case for reconsideration has been made out, the decision then will be referred back either to a new panel or to the previous panel. And the uh, practice has been in most but not all cases to order reconsideration by a differently constituted panel. And the new panel um, is restricted to the original terms of reference uh, that the Secretary of State set out um, in the earlier referral. Uh, and applications for reconsideration may come from one of two sources. They can come from the prisoners themselves, who want reconsideration of a decision to refuse them parole, or they can come from the Secretary of State for Justice, who may want reconsideration of a release uh, decision. There is no direct right for third parties or victims to seek reconsideration directly, but they can ask the Secretary of State if the Secretary of State will make a referral. Only decisions whether to release or not to release a prisoner are eligible for reconsideration, just that binary decision. There are a whole lot of other decisions that the board may uh, reach um, during the conduct of a case, procedural decisions or recommendations, and they fall outside the scope of the scheme. So, um, for example, the decision whether to adjourn or to defer a hearing or whether to hold an oral hearing face-to-face -face or remotely are excluded. The threshold for the successful challenge of a um, decision through the reconsideration mechanism is set at judicial review level. So it doesn't rely on a more easily met merits test. Uh, although the government did leave the door open to a merits-based system to be revisited in the future. Setting the bar at judicial review levels was in part designed to keep the workload manageable, have a high test for success. Hopefully it will mean that there are not so many cases that come through for reconsidera reconsideration. But the effect is to make the scheme a distant cousin of the sort of fully-fledged appeal process that's in place for sentencing decisions, for example. Initially, the scheme allowed a, reconsider a reconsideration application to be made only on the ground that the original decision was irrational or procedurally unfair, traditional judicial review, review grounds. 
However, in 2022, the Parole Board rules, that's the secondary legislation that um, governs parole um, decision-making, added error of law to the grounds. So you've now got uh, procedural unfairness, irrationality, and uh, error of law, although there's a good argument uh, for saying that error of law was itself irrational. When the scheme was created, there was a commitment on the part of the government and indeed the uh, Parole Board to publish all reconsideration application uh, decisions. And um, to some extent, that commitment has been met. And the reconsideration mechanism has proved popular. And indeed, there is no real downside to a prisoner putting in an application for reconsideration. So, for example, in 2021-2022, and the Parole Board operates on financial years rather than calendar years, um, there were 262 applications for reconsideration which were made to the Board. So about a, um, a quarter of those were considered ineligible by the board, um, largely because they were um, challenging procedural questions rather than the binary uh, release uh, decision. So you get a triaging process and about a quarter of them are filtered out. And of the ones that were left in that year, the 195 that were eligible, uh, uh, um, about one-fifth were granted and uh, four-fifths uh, were uh, refused. In total, um, somewhere around 700 to 800 um, reconsider application decisions have now been made. So this is a, quite a level of scale. And of, of those, um, about 550, 60, 70 have been published. There's a tranche of um, decisions that haven't yet been published. Uh, and uh, I have um, pointed this out to the chair of the parole board and they've now undertaken to conduct a review of that and hopefully um, the, the, the remainder will be published um, uh, fairly uh, uh, rapidly. But as you can see from those numbers, this is a mechanism that's used at some considerable um, uh, scale. So en enough about reconsiderations, I'll now turn to public uh, hearings. And to date, um, there have been um, 20 applications um, for uh, parole hearings for prisoners to be held in public. And um, in 16 of those 20 cases, the application was made uh, by the direct victims of the prisoner's crime or members of the victim's families because the um, definition of a victim extends out to that, and obviously that's necessary in the case where the victim is deceased, for example. And um, in, in actually more than half of those 20 cases, the um, prisoners were serving mandatory life sentences for murder. Um, in um, so 16 of the cases, um, applications coming from victims. Um, in three of the cases, the applications came from the prisoners themselves. They themselves were asking for the hearing to be held in public. And in one case, which I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, the Pitchfork case, the application came from an MP. And the list of 20 um, includes some very high-profile uh, prisoners. Uh, there were the... Um, Two uh, wife killers, uh, Russell Causley and uh, Glyn Peter Rizal, both of whom are um, quite notorious because in neither case have they disclosed uh, the whereabouts of the victim's remains. Uh, there's um, Charles Salvador, who um, was formerly known as Charles Bronson, one of the most reported prisoners in the prison system and one of the longest serving uh, prisoners in the uh, prison system. There's Stephen Ling, the so-called Christmas Day killer. There's Colin Pitchfork, uh, and I'm coming to him. There's George Stevenson, the so-called Mansion uh, Massacre killer. There's um, Christopher John Farrow, the um, shoe fetish killer. And uh, quite recently, there's Paul Gadd, uh, who was formerly known as Gary Glitter. So, um, that's um, public hearings. Um, of the uh, 20 
Just uh, five applications have been granted, so 15 have been declined, and it's the chair of the parole board that makes the decision whether the uh, application for a, a parole hearing to be held in public uh, will be granted. And of those five, three have been heard, um, the Causley case, the um, uh, Glyn Rizal case, and the Charles Salvador, Charles Bronson case. I've attended them all, and I'm um, going to attend the um, ones that are pending. There are two that are pending, Stephen Ling uh, and um, the Christmas Day uh, killer and Nicholas um, Bidar, who's uh, an armed robber um, serving uh, a, a, an IPP sentence, uh, and he's a Category A prisoner. So, uh, what, what do I think about those three uh, reforms, decision summaries, uh, the reconsideration mechanism, public hearings. Well, I think some summaries are really successful innovation. They've certainly um, cast uh, a light upon a parole system uh, that was often uh, hidden away in the uh, dark. But as I've indicated a moment ago, um, publication is not uh, uh, possible, has not happened, and I think that's uh, a, a problem until they are put into the public domain. The public's knowledge of them is going to be filtered through the press and the reporting may or may not be accurate. The reconsideration uh, mechanism is, I think, a, a, a really positive innovation. It, it was partly designed to produce, produce a uh, quicker and less costly route to taking a second look at parole decisions without needing to go through the courts and judicial review and the um, uh, need for uh, lawyers to be engaged in order for the case to proceed uh, effectively. Um, uh, but I think that, the, as I indicated a moment ago, the board should publish um, more, much more rapidly all the decisions that it hasn't published up till now, and as I say, it's undertaken uh, to do that. And if it does that, that will help build confidence too. And public hearings, they're in the early days, uh, and there are already questions about whether they go far enough. There's a very high bar that's been set by the board in order for a um, uh, hearing to be held in public. And um, the names of the panel members, the judges announce who they are, but the other non-judicial members of the board have not been saying who they are, and I think you can't have a public hearing without knowing who the judges are in the uh, case. And much of the hearings have been held in private, so you don't see everything. You see only part of it. And in the last one, um, the uh, schedule uh, slipped badly, and um, uh, the evidence that was expected to be held in public wasn't able to be held in public, uh, and it had to be carried over into the private part of the hearing. Okay, so I, I'm Colin Pitchfork. I said I'd say a few things about about Pitchfork. Pitchfork, you will remember, was uh, sentenced in 1988 uh, for the murder of two 15-year-old girls, two murders, four years apart. Um, really um, uh, horrible crimes. And uh, he was the first person to be convicted using DNA fingerprinting uh, evidence. Uh, the victims were Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. And if he had been sentenced today, or even probably in the last 15 years. I think there's little doubt that he would have received a whole life tariff, um, but not in uh, 1988. And if he'd received a whole life tariff, he wouldn't have ever become eligible for parole. Um, he also, at the time, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to pervert the court of, course of justice and two further offences of indecent uh, uh, assault, and he had been convicted at that point on four previous occasions of non-contact sexual offences, which he committed between the age of 17 and 22, and he later admitted to what was described as an extensive history of similar offending, which started when he was below the age of criminal responsibility, so under 11. Um, the minimal custodial period was uh, eventually set at uh, 30 years, but it was reduced to 28 years in 2009 by the Court of Appeal with the Lord Chief Justice uh, presiding in view of the, uh, quote, exceptional progress, unquote, that he made. He's changed his name by Deepol twice since 1988 to protect his identity. Um, Warboys also changed his name. Um, the first parole review was in 2016, and he wasn't released. 
but the panel recommended that he should move to an open uh, prison. And that uh, recommendation was accepted by the Secretary of State in August 2016. He had a, a further parole review two years later in um, 2018, but he was not released. His third parole review was three years later in May 2021, and a panel consisting of two judges and a psychologist held an oral hearing. The professional witnesses who gave evidences in his case concluded that with an extremely robust risk management plan, he was safe to release, although they accepted that there was evidence pointing in another direction. The panel agreed with the conclusion of the professional witnesses, and uh, uh, they direct release. The release decision is controversial. Alberto Costa, who was the MP for uh, South Leicestershire, which is the constituency in which the two villages in which the two girls uh, were killed resides, said he was absolutely appalled at the outcome, quote, and following a request from him to the then Justice Secretary, Sir Robert Buckland, um, um, uh, there was an uh, application for reconsideration of the release uh, decision. Uh, and on the 8th of July 2021, that application was rejected. Uh, and on the 1st of September 2021, Pitchfork was released into the community on parole on a license which included 38 license conditions. Uh, these included uh, polygraph examination, um, which had been regarded by the professional witnesses as, uh, quote, vitally important part of the detailed and comprehensive risk management plan. Within 11 weeks, on the 19th of November 2021, Pitchfork was recalled to custody for breaching his uh, license. And it was alleged that he had approached young women while on his walks from his uh, approved uh, prem premises. The panel um, that had made the decision had recognized that Pitchfork had, quote, a, a, a capacity to, quote, manipulate and deceive, and they had concerns that Pitchfork was, quote, not fully open and honest regarding his future sexual interests. And he had a whole raft of uh, different conditions aside from the polygraph condition. So, um, the um, recall occurs, the case is referred by the Secretary of State back to the board for the fourth time to consider both the appropriateness of the recall and the um, uh, question of whether Pitchfork should uh, be uh, re-released or not, according to the statutory test. And in uh, January 2022, the board decides there needs to be an, surprise, surprise, there needs to be an oral hearing to decide that question. In um, December 2022, Alberto Costo applies for the hearing to be held in public. And uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Justice, then Dominic Raab, supports the application, as do five of the six victims, but not uh, the sixth victim. Um, in March 2023, the chair of the, that's this year, the chair of the parole board declines the application uh, for the hearing to be held in public, um, concluding that um, um, much time would be spent on the recall decision and that it would be inappropriate uh, for a public hearing uh, to um, uh, occur in relation to that due to the confidential nature of the things that would be said. The oral hearings held across three days. Uh, and the panel again includes two judicial members and a psychologist, and it concludes that the recall decision was flawed. Very unusual for the board to conclude that a recall decision was flawed, as it was not supported uh, by the evidence and was made on the basis of some uh, 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 of the allegations not being proved and uh, some um, incorrect uh, information. During the preparation for the review of the recall, it was discovered that the polygraph condition, which had been regarded by the professional witnesses as, quote, vital, because it allowed checks on whether Pitchfork was being truthful with those who were supervising him in the community, had been unlawfully imposed. Um, that was because Pitchfork had been convicted for some sexual offences, but they had expired by that time. And under the primary legislation, uh, it's not possible for a polygraph condition to be introduced in a license for the offence of murder. So um, given the significance of that polygraph con condition to the release plan in 2021, it's somewhat 
surprising and a little bit troubling that that wasn't spotted at the time that the licence was first imposed. Um, the oral hearings take place. Four of the victims and Alberto Costa, the MP, are given permission to observe the parts of the oral hearing. It's not to be held in public, but they're given permission to observe, uh, and they do so, although Costa can only stay for um, the first day because of his parliamentary uh, commitments. Um, so, uh, um, the oral hearing takes place. The panel con uh, concludes the release decision was uh, flawed, and it um, directs Pitchfork's re-release. Once again, the release decision produces controversy. Uh, Alberto Costa says he's deeply disappointed. He says Pitchfork still presents a very real danger to the public. He urges um, Alex Chalk, the new Justice Secretary, to apply for reconsideration and organises, it's reported, a Facebook call for his constituents and others to ask for the decision to be reconsidered um, using the parole board's online uh, form. Um, the mother of one of the victims, Barbara Ashworth, tells Sky News that the decision to release was diabolical. She says she doesn't think there's any way he should be walking the streets. And um, Alex Shork decides to submit a reconsideration application to the board. He says it's absolutely vital that every lawful step is taken to keep dangerous offenders behind uh, bars. And... Um, uh, the reconsideration application is upheld and the case has thus been passed to a new panel for the decision to be reconsidered. Pitchfork remains in uh, custody. The reconsideration application decision hasn't yet been published and uh, I think that in the next month or two um, we will learn whether Pitchfork will be released or not. So, um, the Pitchfork case, as with the War Boys case before it, vividly illustrates some of the perennial dilemmas that confront all parole systems. How much risk should the parole board take, especially with prisoners who have committed uh, very serious crimes and were deemed to be highly dangerous at the time that they were sentenced? Should the parole board in these cases adopt a strongly precautionary approach or not? Is the statutory test sufficient? How much trust can we generally place in the ability of the board to distinguish between those prisoners who are safe to release and those who are not? Is the board able, with an acceptable level of accuracy, to separate out prisoners who have genuinely changed from those who, like John Warboys, were merely highly skilled at impression management. Where a, a prisoner is judged to lack the, necessarily, the necessary internal mechanisms of control needed to stop them from causing serious harm, how much reliance should be placed on the ability of very stringent license conditions to provide the necessary external control? And what's the right balance between uh, the independence of the parole board on the one hand and ministerial control on the other hand. So, some very um, uh, final thoughts. Pitfork Fork is one of 15 prisoners for whom thus far an application for a public parole hearing has been declined and it raises the question of where that bar should be set. Pitchfork's um, uh, May 2023 case the summary hasn't been published. I have a copy of it because I've asked for a copy of it, but and it hasn't been uh, published generally. And name changes. As we've seen, Colin Pitchfork and um, Warboys um, changed their names. And last week, in a uh, speech um, to the Conservative Party conference, the Home Secretary said that the government was going to be introducing legislation to prevent registered sex offenders from changing their identity. Pitchfork's in the unique position of having stimulated two different um, applications from the Secretary of State for reconsideration. One was unsuccessful and one was uh, successful. Um, before the introduction of that reconsideration mechanism, the only way to have done that would have been through judicial review and indeed before war boys um, there had never been a judicial review of a release uh, decision. 
And I'll just finish with the Shadow Justice Secretary who um, said this um, during the committee stage of the Victims and Prisoners Bill. This is Ellie Reeves. She said, the decisions to release John Warboys, Colin Pitchfork, and Tracy Connolly. Tracy Connolly was one of the defendants in the Baby Peter, Baby P um, case, serving an IPP. Um, rightly, she says, caused public outrage and undermined confidence in the parole board. Well, um, the question is, have the measures that have been introduced since John Warboys been sufficient to bolster public confidence? Has there been a change in public perceptions of parole um, following the trauma that the John, Boy, John Warboys case caused? I'm happy to take any questions, but that concludes what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.